On the shores of a vast river delta, stout, palm tree-like plants no taller than the average man extended curved branches into the air, hanging from them with thin crimson filaments swaying in the wind, filtering aeroplankton out of the thick, oxygen-rich air. Schools of fish with rainbow-colored feathery fins rushed downstream, gleaming in the white sunlight, making it look as though the water was made out of spilled fluorescent dyes. A shadow emerged in the midst of this vivid stream. A huge, flat creature buried into the shallow riverbed opened its mouth and swallowed dozens of rainbow fish. The gap was soon closed, and the glittering tapestry continued its voyage downstream. Far away, on the same world, a gigantic, bulbous creature floated over a field of razor-sharp red grass, its tentacles dangling only half a meter above the surface, reaching for the blue blossoms of a nameless flower. When they hit, seeds and nectar were tenderly extracted by the translucent tubes to be spread across the land. Small critters in vibrant hues of red and blue sailed above the ground. To a human observer, they would have looked a bit like stingrays without tails, always ready for a soft landing among the tall blades when airborne predators were around. Enormous land striders with six legs, scaled cobalt skin and thick hooves trampled the grass, migrating from their summer feeding grounds in the north, to the lush jungles of the south to sustain themselves over the winter. High up in a snow-covered mountain range, compact, four-limbed creatures clad in thick black fur scaled the walls with their ice-pick-shaped claws. In their pouches they carried strange fruit and alien fungi harvested in the danger-ridden valley far beneath them. They made this climb every day, for their colony was hidden within the icy caves by the glaciers of this granite massif and their young were impatiently awaiting dinner time. To Captain Sandra Hodemarker, that entire world was nothing but letters, numbers, and a name shared with hundreds of other planets. 3887-UJS4, as it were, was a piece of rock covered in organic matter circling an F-class star. Her ship, the BPPS Dyson 5, orbited the unusually colorful garden world with its seven continent and peacock blue oceans alongside the BPPS Dyson 2 under Captain Dick Werner and the BPPS Harrison 4 under Captain Yeji de Bonheur. All three ships were identical. Huge, almost cruiser-sized hulks of black and grey with modified siege cannons the size of high-rises, broad laser banks, countless hatches and missile racks protruding from their fat bellies. However, no matter how identical the ships were, Dyson 5 was in charge of this operation. Her captain was the top dog in the system, and the others took their orders directly from her. Sandra Hodemarker was a woman in her mid-sixties. She was tall, of lean yet wiry build, and had a distinctive triangular face with a pudgy nose and prominent cheekbones. The slight onset of wrinkles in the corners of her thin-lipped, wide and unsmiling mouth hinted at her age, but otherwise her skin glowed in a healthy, reddish hue, and her short, soft hair was still the color of chestnuts. Her piercing, light brown eyes observed the short and burly projection of Captain Werner, his black sideburns framing a broad, pale face, and the coltish, walnut-skinned and large-breasted image of Captain Bonner. Like herself and almost everyone else on the ship, the two captains were clad in the black and grey uniforms of Bishbalik Planetary Purifications, a corporation specializing in the removal of ecosystems from planets where they did not belong. In the case of Esterich 3887-UJS4, that meant the planet had extremely valuable metal and mineral deposits, as well as oil, gas and coal, but the ecosphere was inconvenient for comfortably establishing a large-scale mining operation there. We're ready to begin then, asked Vernus Projection in a deep, rumbling voice. He was nervously tapping his leg. Yes, I have unlocked the warheads, was the answer. As operations commander, she had to unlock nuclear weaponry for the entire fleet before anyone could fire their rockets. This mechanism was officially in place because Federation regulations demanded it, but out here in lawless space, those regulations were not much more than junk data. The real reason was that, even for a multi-terra counter corporation, hydrogen bombs were expensive and losing one because some idiot hit the wrong button would look bad in the balancing books. 
you should have received the trajectories for your missiles and prepped your systems for launch. If you would call your EXOs to authorize the release of nuclear weapons on your respective ships, the operation will start at exactly 0300 standard. Werner nodded. Of course, he and Bonaire had already ordered all of those things done. They were very familiar with the protocols and had no desire to stay in this system for any longer than necessary. Please note that we are not using intelligent delivery systems or launch facilities, so please instruct your steerers to stay precisely in their indicated positions, Sandra added. The impact of every single warhead had been meticulously planned and tested in simulation by Taya Gwazdek and a team of planetary sterilization engineers. If any one of them missed by even a few kilometers because of unforeseen interference, they would have to manually bombard patches of land not caught in the blast radius, which would cost time, material and money. Wigurd Albrici, Hodemarker's XO, inserted his authorization code for weapons launch. He was a short man with latte-coloured skin and deep-set eyes of a very dark umber, crowned by bushy eyebrows. Always fashionable, the Italian had combed back his gold-brown hair and shaved off his beard, in accordance with the latest trends from Nuova Etruscia. After she gave the go-ahead, a big red timer appeared floating over the projection of Estridge 3887UJS4 that dominated the CIC. The computer had taken over for final launch sequence, coordinating with the rudimentary AIs on the Dyson 2 and the Harrison 4, so as to eradicate any discrepancies. 60 seconds to sterilization, said the artificial voice of a friendly yet distant female. Hodemarka saw Werner's projection give a satisfied smile. She knew that the captain, like most sane people, did not like operations in lawless space especially since their security detachment had been shrunk to a few guards on every ship for financial reasons. It was highly unlikely they would be attacked by random pirates, but it would not be the first time conservationist terrorists managed to hack into secure databases to retrieve mission schedules, or lay in wait for people to show up at planets they knew were marked for sterilization. The thought of being back in the relative safety of Federation territory, where killing a fleet of contractors would at least be illegal, was very comforting. 30 seconds to sterilization, said the voice. She looked to a right, where Hong Zhang Ni was formally complimenting Taya Gwazdek on her efficiency. The sterilization engineer modestly urged him to wait for the results, preemptively conceding that she might have overlooked something. But the old Chinese man had been in the business long enough to recognize good work before it went down. He and his aide were the only people in the system not wearing Bishbalik uniforms, as he was an independent surveyor and notary who had confirmed the complete annihilation of the planet's terrestrial biosphere, and formulate a report that BPP would refer to in case the customer was, or claimed to be, unsatisfied with their work. It had been Sandra's concern that Hong would stall their departure from the system, seeing as he was a very thorough man who did not put his seal under anything he did not fully stand behind. But his preliminary congratulations gave Hodemark a reassurance he would let them wrap up quickly and make for civilization. Five seconds to sterilization. Sandra took a sip of her coffee. High above the shores of the vast river delta, a Kali-type thermonuclear fusion warhead launched the final phase of its ignition process. Three massive energy cells pumped all of their power into the deuterium-tritium compound situated in the tip, starting the radically destructive process of uncontrolled nuclear fusion. 100 meters above ground, the bomb detonated. A heat wave of unfettered neutrons combined with raw explosive pressure from the energy escaping the enclosed space of the warhead into the world around them vaporized tens of thousands of liters of water carried by the river in a matter of nanoseconds. Rocks the size of cars were pulverized like dry sandcastles, and anything organic would have been burned to a crisp had it not been atomized first. On the white plains of red grass, the gigantic, bulbous creature dissipated into nothingness before the blast even reached the ground. The powerful backs of the enormous landstriders, capable of carrying entire buildings, were transformed into shapeless mush that bore no resemblance to their dense musculature. The little stingrays ceased to exist completely. High up in the snowed-in Sierras, gigantic formations of rock and stone were carried away by the blast and spread over kilometers of valleys. The furry climbers were swept off the walls, their glacial homes sublimating from solid straight to gas. Never again would there be rainbows of light shimmering in the waters, 
or clouds of seed raining from the skies, or hairy little whelps waiting for their parents to bring them big yellow mushrooms from the valley. In less than five seconds, all life on the planet had been annihilated by the hellfire of technological efficiency. Sterilization complete. A mere 600 fusion warheads were required to do the job. There would be no radioactive fallout, but the dust would need a few months to settle. As the first deep scans and readings came in, applause and congratulations filled the CIC of the Dyson 5. The operation had been a full success. Hodemarker looked over to Albrici, who was shaking Tia Gwazdek's hand and complimenting her skill in planning the sterilization in his flamboyant and heavily flirtatious manner. Hong was already sitting in his workstation, skimming through preliminary thermal sweeps, videos, and images of the explosions taken from orbit. Hodemarker looked at the projection of 3887-UGS4, still displaying the colorful world that had ended a few moments ago. She was glad they didn't have to clean up the oceans as well. Oceans were always tricky business and took forever. Congratulations, Sandra, said Yiji de Bonaire, her projection nodding respectfully. Thank you, Captains, and congratulations right back at you. Really, the one we should be celebrating is Miss Gwosdeg, of course, she replied. Bright future, that one, said Werner, arms akimbo. Hodemarker saw both of them were itching to give the order for FTL spin-up, though Bonaire was, as always, much calmer than her colleague. Three hours later, when Hong was satisfied with the image resolution and the grade of cleanliness on the planet's surface to put his DNA signature under the appropriate documents, the three vessels gathered outside 3887 Estrich UJS-4's gravity well and warmed up their Alcubierre drives for the impending jump to the Gromit system 27 hours away. As the ship finally accelerated into its own space-time bubble, Sandra Hodemarker felt the warm anticipation of coming home, even though that would still take a while. She hadn't seen her family in four months, and her husband and daughter were surely planning the homecoming dinner already. The thought of Samuel standing in the kitchen of their lakeside abode on Evermore, Cecilia running around him like the 16-year-old whirlwind that she was, brought a smile to her face. Maybe Adrian would fly in from university for a weekend or two and boast of his latest investigative exploits in the crime simulations. As much as Sandra enjoyed these deployments into the depths of space, the thing she loved most in the universe was her family.